Good morning. My name is Cherish Jones, and it's my privilege to serve as your worship associate again today. Here, let us find a house of welcoming, gather to find vision and hope, be received as we truly are, unique and beautiful, our journeys, however different, acknowledged, our love honored. Let us rejoice together. Welcome to this good place. Tapestry, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. In the spring of 1997, I put on my cap and gown and walked confidently across my school's gymnasium to accept my high school diploma. I had worked hard to earn it. I was on the honor roll. I took extra classes, even college courses, to graduate early. And I worked two jobs so I could earn enough money to move from my tiny mountain town in the Rocky Mountains to the beaches of Southern California. I was 18, and although it would make sense to say that I had it all figured out, that is not a truthful statement at all. Yes, I had done all of that. I had even signed a lease to move into an apartment in San Clemente with my older brother, who had just been discharged from the Marines. But looking back, I was really headed blindfolded down a path that I had absolutely no clue what it would lead to. The morning after I walked down the aisle of my gymnasium, I climbed into my dad's car, the top of which was carrying everything I owned, a mattress and a duffel bag. And I moved to San Clemente. I had no job, no car, just a signed lease with an apartment with my older brother. I knew I wanted to be here and I knew I could do it. I knew, although I didn't know how, that I would find a job, earn enough to get a car, and I would begin the next chapter of my life here in California. And looking back at that time, what I did was so huge. But now in retrospect, it was just a tiny blurb in my life. I recently came across one of my favorite sayings. It is a compilation of all those little things in the past that will make you who you are as a whole today. And what seems like the biggest things today, they will just be tiny stepping stones to the next part of the amazing journey that we call life. Today, we welcome three of our own fellow tapestry congregants, Dave Weber, Betsy Martin, and Bonnie Coombs as our, fav er, as our guest speakers. A little over a year ago, a race matters group was formed here at Tapestry to discuss racial issues. The group has read books and articles and viewed videos to gain information and to stimulate conversation. It meets monthly to discuss those materials and share different experiences and perspective on race matters. These three members are part of this great group and will share with us what they've learned from being in the group. Also today we have a guest performer, a Southern California born classical lyric tenor Gabriel Paredes began his musical training at Los Angeles County High School for the Arts and received his BA in vocal performance from Azusa Pacific University. Gabriel has been the tenor section leader at UU Santa Monica for the past four years and is a co-founder and artistic director of the Sunday Opera, a state nonprofit de dedicated to bringing classical music to the community. I got to hear him earlier and he's amazing. Sing with each other and we can continue our conversations with refreshments after the service. We have some exciting events coming up at Tapestry. You can find information about these and other upcoming events in your order of service or on the website. But first I would like to invite Laura Jackson up for a brief announcement. Hi everybody. 
I just came back from a week at our beautiful Camp de Beneville Pines with the senior high youth, which was awesome. And so I'm very full of energy for um, encouraging you to come to camp for our retreat for the weekend. That's the 7th through the 9th of October. We share the camp with Orange Coast and Laguna and the Laughers of Laguna. And we have a really wonderful weekend from Friday afternoon all the way through Sunday afternoon. And you get to share a cabin and we get to share meals. There's like, I don't know, like eight cabins uh, with indoor plumbing, very comfortable mattresses. It's very light camping. Um, and we enjoy meals. We have activities, event, you know, um, both physical activities and just chance to talk and do crafts together, like tie-dye and whatnot. So um, please see me after the service. If you're interested, I have uh, forms in the office and I'll uh, tell you more about it. She said she was full of energy after a week at camp. I just got back from a week of Girl Scout camp with a hundred Girl Scouts and I needed four margaritas. <laughs> and now Linda Jurgen will light our flaming chalice, the central symbol of our Unitarian Universalist heritage. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lit the flame within us. Please join me in saying our covenant, followed by our song of affirmation. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth and love, and to help one another. opening words are by David Breedham. We unite in our differences in background and belief. We unite with gratitude and hope. Hope for a world of differences. Hope for a world that honors difference. Today's celebrations and concerns include one from Nikki Jackson and Al Mortensen. We've had three great grandchildren born in the last two weeks. Oh, yay. Welcome to Cameron and to twins, Lauren and Ben. Linda Yergen says congratulations to Bev Huck, Peggy Thompson, Ellen DeYoung, and to Cheryl Howard, and to Kofi for being media stars in the LA Times this morning. There's an article in the back that you guys can read. They're famous. Oh, it looks like that's it. All the rest were empty. So uh, there's also been a few candles lit as well for those that are silent. For, um, please join me in the congregational response to these spoken and unspoken joys and sorrows. For your joys, we join you in celebration. For your sorrows and concerns, may you feel our compassion. For all that is spoken and unspoken, may the peace of our beloved community sustain you. And now, I invite our children and young at heart to come forward and join Caitlin Riva as she reads the story for the time for all ages. Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. So this book is written from the first person perspective, which means I'm going to be saying I, I, I. I'm not talking about me. Okay, it's written by a man, first of all. Okay, he's much older than me and he's black. So it's not me when it says I, I, I. But you'll figure that out, I'm sure. It says, let's talk about race. You guys know what race is? Not like racing for, not like going in a race. Like your color makes you a 
Yeah. yeah. Or your All right, EJ and Eddie, you need to sit down on the carpet, okay? Can you come sit down, please? All right, you two, right here. Can you sit in front of Piper? Want to turn around so you can see the book? Or are you all right? All right. I am a story. So are you. So is everyone. My story begins the same way yours does. I was born on, take me for example. I was born on January 27, 1939 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm kind of old, huh? <laughs> How does your story begin? Many people and many events are part of my story and yours too. The names of our parents and where they were born, whether or not we have brothers and or sisters, what kind of work our parents do or did. My father was a minister and my mother was a housewife. My story and yours have many elements, such as your favorite food, hobbies, favorite color, religion, nationality, favorite time of day. Oh, there's something else. That is part of my story. It's part of yours, too. That's what race we are. I'm black. What race are you? Just as I am a story and you are a story and countries tell stories about themselves, race is a story, too. Whether you're black like me or Asian, Hispanic, or white, each race has a story about itself. And that story is almost always the same. My race is better than your race. Some stories are true, some are not. Those who say, my race is better than your race, are telling a story that is not true. Why would some people say their race is better than another? Because they feel bad about themselves? Because they are afraid? Because, but there are other ways all of us, even me, even you, think we are better than others. I'm better than you because I live in so and so place. I'm better than you because I go to such and such school. I'm better than you because I'm a boy. I'm better than you because I'm a girl. I'm better than you because my mom or dad makes more money than your mom or dad. I'm better than you because I'm white. I'm better than you because I'm black. None of these stories are true, are they? I want to tell a true story, but I need your help. Here's what I want you to do. Take your fingers and press them softly against your skin, right below your eyes. Be careful, don't poke yourself in the eye. Okay now, press gently until you feel the hard bone right beneath the surface. Can you feel the bone, your cheekbone, the top of it? Beneath everyone's skin are the same hard bones. You can feel them on your shin, right, on your knees. If you were to go outside without your skin on and without your hair on your head, turn the page and see what you would look like. But you want to know something? If I went outside without my skin, my mustache and the hair on my head, what little I have left, I would look just like you, and you would look just like me. Which story shall we believe? The one that says, my race is better than yours? Or the one we just discovered for ourselves, that beneath our skin, I look like you, and you look like me? And she looks like her and him, and he looks like him and her, and we look like them, and they look like us. When I look at you, which story do I see? Do I see only the color of your skin, the shape of your eyes, the texture of your hair? Do I look at you and think I know your story when I don't even know your name? Or do I look at you and wonder, what is your name? Where were you born? Where do you live? What kind of things do you like? What kind of things do you not like? Maybe we like and dislike the same things. Your race is not all that you are. My race is not all that I am. Yes, I am black, but I am also a man. I am of medium height. I have a deep voice and a loud laugh. I love to laugh. Do you? I live in a big house in the woods in a small town. I like pancakes and macaroni and cheese. And, and, and. I am so, so many things besides my race. To know my story, you have to put together everything I am. Like I bet you didn't know I have asthma. Beneath the skin, we all look alike, you and me. I'll take off my skin. Will you take off yours? All right, so that is our story for today. We are going to go in the big classroom all together. Those of you who are a bit older, let's see, Garrett, Jack, 
Kathy and uh, Ainsley, if you would like to, and um, Greta, if you want to, we're, you're going to help with a social. Prophesy, oh my people, prophesy one more time. Announce to them the coming of our new society. Announce to all the people that justice promised long. Restore to every nation true peace throughout the world. Prophesy, O oh my people, prophesy one more time announce to them the coming of our new society ya tienes causa el llanto y la opresión la verdad sea tu escudo se luz de un nuevo sol profetiza pueblo mío profetiza una vez más Anunciando a los pobres una nueva sociedad. Let this be what you hope for, the battle that you chose. Consult the social order with justice at its core. Prophesy, oh my people, prophesy one more time. Let your voice be the echo of the outcries of all oppressed. Prophesy, oh my people, prophesy one more time. Announce to them the coming of our new society. Anunciando a los Good morning. Today's reading comes from our own Bill Parker. If you or your loved ones are ever exposed to the legal system in a negative way, pray to your God or ask the universe to give you the same justice that a black man in this country would receive today. No more, no less. If you or your loved ones are ever exposed to the legal system in a negative way, pray to your God or ask the universe to give you the same justice that a black man in this country would receive today. No more, no less. In an ideal world, that would be good advice. But in today's America, would you really want to be treated like a black man? Let's have a moment of quiet meditation.
we've seen advances in black representation in the professions and government, integration in sports, and the removal of legal barriers to integration in our communities. And we have even elected a black man president. So if you had asked me a year ago, I'd have said that racism is largely behind us, that being colorblind was the proper way to pursue interactions with people. And I embraced the idea that all lives matter and didn't support emphasizing any one group. The Race Matters group at Tapestry has dramatically transformed my perceptions and beliefs. I strongly recommend that those of you who, like me, consider yourselves well-informed liberals join this or a similar group where books and videos are discussed in a confidential group setting. Our first read was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. I learned that the concept of race was introduced as a way to justify enslaving Africans. Race was a fabrication created to support capitalist greed. That was an eye-opener. And so was the fact that race isn't necessarily about skin color, nor is it fixed. As Celia told us two weeks ago, cultural differences can identify someone as other, effectively making them a person of color in our society. Irish, Italian, and Eastern European immigrants were once considered non-white, but later generations were able to assimilate, blend in, and effectively become white. That wasn't an option for African Americans and Asians whose appearance remained an easy differentiator. They have remained others, persons of color, for generation upon generation. Alexander then put to bed the myth of emancipation and equalization. After the Civil War, Southern states quietly re-enslaved African Americans. Southern businesses refused to hire freed slaves who were then incarcerated indefinitely for vagrancy and lent out from prison to perform free labor. To justify the inhumanity, first of actual slavery and then of this new era of Jim Crow, blacks were painted as less than human and inherently criminal as interactions between whites and people of color would have shown the fallacy of these arguments, segregation was legislated. To enforce it, blacks were subjugated, abused, and lynched. People, including those of color themselves, were indoctrinated with the image of black inferiority. That perception became universal, so things were only marginal, but marginally better in the North, and not much changed for a century. After the civil rights movement of the 1960s, overt racism was largely suppressed, but racist attitudes indoctrinated into the psyche of the nation and the poverty caused by hundreds of years of oppression continued to put people of color at a distinct disadvantage. Under the best of circumstances, it was going to take a long time to undo the effects of slavery and Jim Crow. Then, starting with the Nixon administration, right-wing neocons saw a way to reverse the civil rights movement by selectively incarcerating blacks in a war against crime. And sadly, a number of liberal politicians wanting to appear tough jumped on board. Police, many brought up with racist views, patrol poor black neighborhoods harassing young men. Although drug usage among the races is comparable, blacks, especially men, were arrested far more often for drug violations and given more severe punishments than whites. The war on crime and selective mass incarceration of blacks has continued up to the present. As a result, jail populations have increased sevenfold in the last 40 years, with a disproportionate number of blacks imprisoned. An article by Ta-Nehisi Coates in The Atlantic discussed the impact on black families of this mass incarceration. The absence of so many males who could be prime breadwinners for their families and role models for their sons has devastated the society. Since prisoners and released convicted felons cannot vote, the political force of the black community has been suppressed. Resources have been transferred from public health and education into a greatly increased for-profit prison industry. And the attitudes that blacks are criminals and failures has been reinforced into the American psyche. The war on crime has been a disaster for African Americans. Group members ask what can be done about this injustice in our midst. Racist attitudes can't be changed overnight, so there are no quick or easy solutions. Random violence against police born of frustration isn't an answer. It only reinforces the stereotypes and turns sympathies against people of color. However, we could work 
to promote improving police sensitivity training and punishing those who ex exercise excessive force, changing minor drug offenses from felonies to misdemeanors that are met with treatment rather than imprisonment, providing job training to give ghetto youth a path out of poverty and crime, and retraining convict, uh, release convict convicts to reduce recidivism. Ultimately, we decided we have to begin by fixing ourselves. Group members realize that we have been subject to the same indoctrination as everyone else, and that we need to address at a personal level our own individual prejudices before we could become part of the solution. Members of the group have therefore sought to discuss our prejudices openly and candidly. That every one of us is to some extent a racist was another aha moment for me. The group next addressed the fact that we remain largely racially and culturally segregated in our daily lives and that we need to interact more with people different from us and not shy away from discussing with them how their journeys have been affected by racism. That may be our next effort as a group, an outreach to communities of color. Maybe together we can make more of a difference. Our most recent read, Witnessing Whiteness by Shelley Taklock, addressed privilege. Because I'm white, I can be out on the streets of an exclusive suburb after dark or drive a Mercedes without attracting attention, while a black person doing either would be considered suspicious. The police selectively target people of color for traffic stops because they've been indoctrinated to believe that blacks are inherently criminal. And what happens if a stop turns violent? UUA President Peter Morales said recently, police de-escalate situations and disarm white people every day, yet they use deadly force with African Americans. Why? Because society implicitly condones the murder by police of people of color. Wow. In America today, it appears black lives really don't matter. I'm fortunate to have white privilege. Yet, until I joined the Race Matters group, I didn't think much of it. Most people don't. Most white people don't. We don't have to. But people of color have to think about it all the time. The group has brought home to me that human rights are not universal and that we cannot rest until they become so. Because black lives have been devalued, I now understand the need to support the Black Lives Matter movement. And I've learned that being colorblind ignores racist attitudes embedded in our culture and injustices buried in our institutions. We need instead to see and judge people of color in light of what they have lived and continue to live through. And give them some breaks to level the playing field. It's true that we've made strides. But I now understand that despite centuries of blood, sweat, and tears, racism and injustice remain pervasive. We have much work ahead of us. Still, if we have the courage to talk to one another openly and truthfully, bring ever more people into the discussion so they can learn as I have and work together for change, I believe there is hope for the future. As Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Wow, Dave, you have said a lot in six or seven minutes. Mine is going, my presentation is going to be more personal. And let me get this computer up. I am happy to have this opportunity to speak to all of you because it made me organize my thoughts from the discussion group that I've been involved in probably for the last eight months. My first entrance into the whole concept and the whole discussion of racism in America started with Ferguson. Michael Brown was shot and killed by an officer. At the time, I thought that the, op the officer looked at Michael Brown and thought he was a threatening presence. 
And then Michael Brown stuck his hand into the police car. This is what I had read. And I thought, yeah, if I were the, the officer, I, I'd be scared too. What is he going to do? Is he going to take my rifle out of there or, or what? And so the tensions rose. And he shot him, killed him. And I was arguing vehemently in a restaurant, voices getting louder and louder and louder with a friend of mine who happens to be a communist uh, American who lives in Germany, who thinks everything about America is bad, racist, you know, over and overly miserably capitalist, and everything is bad, 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 bad. So I wasn't surprised that she was really telling me, you know, all police are racist. All police are racist. How can you say such a thing? Anyway, there was a 95-year-old woman who is white and very active all of her life in the black movement uh, since she had witnessed a lynching in Florida when she was eight years old. And I admire and respect her perspective on life. Julia, are police racist? She didn't hesitate and said, yes. Well, Betsy was resolved to silence. I was stunned. Julia said that. Then I joined this group, and I got to learn and understand about institutional racism systemic racism, unconscious racism. We whites so often have no idea what our subconscious is doing to us and how we act on it. And so individual policemen might be very conscious about race and issues and people and differences and cultural differences and so on. But as a, as a group, they have these unconscious feelings and it, 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 it reflects itself in their behavior for better or for worse. At this time, I'd like you to look at the sheet you got when you came in. It's called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. For those young people, a knapsack is a backpack. <laughs> I'll give you a little bit to look it over if you haven't had a chance to, so we'll just take a few moments. For those people who are watching this on the YouTube or video, what I have passed out is a list of 50 items that are called examples of white privilege. For example, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. Or, I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring my own race. This is the sheet that I passed out. You can find it online on YouTube under Peggy McIntosh white privilege, unpacking the invisible nap sack. At this time, Jan's going to take the mic, and I've asked a few people if they would choose uh, one or two items on this list and how it has grabbed them. What, how, it has, how has that stood out to you as being something that um, you'd like to share? Cheryl? take Kofi off the hook and I'm going to speak for both of us and um, I think 
number four where it says I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me so when Kofi first came to live with me the first night we took Grady out for a walk I thought huh I better introduce him to the neighbors I know the Joneses and there are a few people in the neighborhood like them my next door neighbors that see directly into my kitchen had seen a litany of black faces passing through so they were cool but I thought my neighbors down the street who at the annual Christmas party brag about how they pack their own bullets and former policemen I thought this may not be if he's going to go out by himself at night walking the dog and so that was a slap in the face for me to realize that what I took for granted constantly I mean 11 12 o'clock at night as the Joneses can attest as Grady barks and wakes him up um, I never ever thought about going out at night and walking the dog but um, it became important to me to introduce him to all the neighbors who I have to say have been very very accepting and welcoming but it was the first time that I thought about stepping out of my house at night and not being safe Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Kofi. Jeff? I have um, this one. Uh, 47, I can travel alone or with my beautiful spouse um, without expecting embarrassment or hostility in those who deal with us, which is fine for me, but was not fine for my parents. And they had to, when we were coming here from Chicago, they had to drive all the way through some states because the, it was that way. That Because my dad is black and my mom is white, it was really not easy for them. So I don't have to think about that at all. And it's not good. Please, Dan. The, well, this is kind of not off of one of those, but watching because Jeff passes because he looks white, but his sister looks kind of like Princess Jasmine, so much more Indian. And I remember people saying to her, well, do you have a dark suntan? Or like, what's wrong with you or something? Because her complexion is darker. And it just made me think about it. Please, Bill Parker. Bill is part of our group, our discussion group on race matters. I'm so glad he's in our group, as well as Celia, our, uh, our two Thank voices you. who have to speak for our people. <laughs> Bill. It's, not a, it, it's not part of this list, but what I, what I think is a white privilege that I don't enjoy is I can demand courtesy from a law enforcement official in any situation without fearing for my life. So you said something that's not on this list is that something you do not enjoy is any confrontation or any, not com any engagement with police and not feel threatened threatened to the point that y your life is in danger. I know I have never felt endangered by police presence. Part of that is that as a woman I am not threatening looking and women in general to men are not threatening. You know, they can overpower us, almost all of them can. Uh, so I should probably beef up and take karate and be more forceful if I needed to. Anybody else would like to comment? Hi, I was raised in La Crescenta, which is a very white area north of Glendale, which had sunset laws up and through the 50s that black people needed to be out of town by sundown. Um, wow. I was raised also that I wasn't racist, that you know everybody was equal and everything was wonderful. And when I went to college, I went to Cal State LA uh, and I majored in sociology 
and it was in the 60s, the late 60s, and who did I find in my classes but all these black people who got to go to college for the first time. And what did we discuss? We discussed race relations. I didn't learn much about sociology because we were so busy discussing race relations in all my classes. And at the time, I was a little bit upset but I also knew that I was getting an education that nobody else would get unless you were there. I heard the anger. I heard, you know, I heard the whole thing and it really changed my life. And when I'd go home and try and tell my parents innocently, they didn't want to hear it because of this insipid racist that's in us. And I can feel it sometimes. I can feel that insipid racist in me if I meet somebody, a black person or an Asian, and I feel fearful. And I have to tell myself it's that individual person. It's not because they're black or Asian. Thank you very, very much. That was a very powerful statement, as all of yours have been. I'm going to conclude now. We have one per more person after me. Um, I would encourage all of you to use this sheet, share it with people of color and others, uh, other white people that, uh, uh, I say other, you know, assuming I'm speaking from my point of view, share it with all races, share it with your neighbors and friends, talk about it. It's a wonderful way to open a conversation that's very difficult, at least in my, my uh, life, to f find those opportunities to approach this subject. And I have uh, done this with my neighbor, who I've known for five years. I said, look at this, circle some stuff. It opened up the conversation, and it's so valuable. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you through a very short journey of my life regarding racism. When I was 18, I became engaged to a young East Indian medical student from British Guiana. When I brought him home to meet my parents, they refused to let him in the door because his skin was dark. Not willing to lose their approval, I broke off my relationship with Moti. A year later, I attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, where I did it interracially and internationally. I had become very aware of my racial identity at that point. My parents taught me well that race matters. By 1962, I was actively involved in the Civil Rights Movement. I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, just SNCC and took nonviolent training from a man known as Stokely Carmichael, who worked with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. During the Selma Montgomery March, I answered calls calling into the university regarding the march. Later that day, I boarded a bus as one of 44 students headed for Selma, Alabama. We never made it there. The police dogs had attacked the demonstrators on the bridge in Selma, and we had received instructions to travel to Washington, D.C. Thus began a five-day sit-in in front of the White House and legislative visits to our senators and representatives. Later, President Johnson signed into law the Voting Rights Bill as a result of the march and our pressure on them. It was around this time that I was at home in a farming community of Sparta, Wisconsin, where my parents owned a small motel. I was helping out in the office when a black family came to the door. My parents stood behind the room divider that separated the office from the rest of the house and ordered me to lie to the family, telling them we had no vacancy. We have plenty of rooms available. Again, I went against my conscience and obeyed my parents. 
But from that day on, I never again allowed myself to be coerced into doing something I believed was wrong. The years went by, and I married, and I did marry a white man. I knew that I believed in zero population growth, so I planned on having two children biologically and adopting two. After our first son was born in 1969 and died from a birth defect at 13 days old, we turned to adoption. My husband Ken and I told the agency we would accept any child who was over the age of three months old. I couldn't stand to lose another child. Thus we adopt James, who is biracial. His mother was German American and his father was black. What a joy he has been. Three years later, our biological child, Robert, was born with the help of fertility drugs and artificial insemination. Thus, we had one biological son and one adopted. As James grew, I experienced racial prejudice, but nothing like I recently learned that James himself did. When I joined the Race Matters group, I thought I was aware of what it meant for James to be raised in a white family. I was wrong. I began to ask James questions about what it had been like for him. Before we got him in Springfield, Illinois in 1971, we had bought a house in the Austin area of Chicago, aware that it was a changing neighborhood. It had been all white and now was being integrated. However, being unaware of my white neighbor's feelings about black people, I inadvertently told her that Ken and I were adopting a biracial child. She became so incensed that she chased me onto the porch brandishing a broom. We never spoke again. When James was five years old, we sent him to a private Baptist, <clears throat> excuse me, kindergarten rather than send him to the public school, which by that time had become less than desirable. I believe that this is one example of white privilege. We had the ability to make choices. Many of our neighbors didn't. Soon after that, we sold our house and moved to an apartment in the neighboring suburb of Oak Park, which was truly integrated. The city limited the number of black families to four per block, thus shifting, stopping the shift of the population from all white to all black. This created a truly integrated neighbor community. Excuse me, mouth dry. In 1980, when James was eight and Robert was five, Ken changed jobs. And with trepidation, we moved to mostly all white Irvine, California. That's when things began to change for James. Prior to that time, he had been surrounded by black and mixed race children and adults. We all had. Suddenly, James was pretty much alone. However, because he is so charismatic, he still made friends. Robert, being high-functioning autistic, had a much harder time. In 1983, Ken's job took us to Saudi Arabia. We did not live in a compound, so we were surrounded by people from several different countries. In fact, in the American International School the boys attended, there were over 40 nas different nationalities represented. During our two years stay in Saudi, we visited multiple third world countries, including Kenya, Nepal, India and Thailand. There we learned about many different cultures and races. In 1985, we returned home to Irvine. Recently, after beginning the course, reading the books and material on race and white privilege, and having discussion groups, I began having more intercourse with James regarding these subjects. 
Since her return, James, who was six feet tall at the time, has been stopped by the police so many times that he has been on a first name basis with one of the police in Irvine because he is black. Although he became the first black drum major in the high school band, he had been discriminated against on multiple occasions. He was stopped in Irvine once when he was riding an expensive bicycle that he had built with money he earned at working at a bicycle shop. The police wanted to know why a black boy was riding in Irvine on an expensive bike. <clears throat> Would they have stopped a white or Asian boy and questioned him? I doubt it. James has helped me understand white privilege also. Not so much in words, but by showing me how it feels to be black in a white society. I was very naive when it came to his experiences. I didn't ask questions or read enough pertaining to race. I was caught up in my own and Robert's issues regarding mental illness. And because James was so self-sufficient and open, I didn't concern myself so much with his issues. Now I realize that he had a rough time. This class has really opened my eyes. You have heard from Dave and Betsy in more detail about this extraordinary discussion group. I appreciate having you along on my journey regarding issue, racial issues. Thank you for listening to us. Such a feast as men's in length, such a strength as makes his guest. My joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joy in We extinguish this flame knowing that the light remains in the warmth and compassion of our hearts until we are together again. Our closing words are by Jean Ricard. We have a calling in this world we are called to honor diversity, to respect differences with dignity, and to challenge those who would forbid it. We are people of a wide path. Let us be wide in affection and go our way in peace.